Good day. It's so good to be here together in your places. And uh, thank you for uh, being here with me, uh, wherever you may be, uh, wherever here is for you. Also, I uh, wanted to say again, uh, last opportunity to do this until, well, maybe not the last opportunity, but until, at least till next year, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. Today is the fourth Sunday in Advent, and um, we're having our service in the morning, uh, regular service in the morning on Sunday the 24th, and then we're going to be having our Christmas Eve candlelight service in the evening, and you can see, uh, maybe you can see some candles behind me uh, that we'll have all lit up, and we have candles elsewhere, and it's, it's one of those things that we do here annually at Redwater Alliance. So we've been going through this journey, this time of preparation during the Advent season, uh, pondering and considering many things uh, about our culture, about ourselves, uh, how we deal with Christmas, and et cetera, et cetera. And today, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, we want to be looking a little closer and a little deeper into who Jesus is. Well, friends, C.S. Lewis was not only a professor of English literature at Oxford University, he is also known as one of the 20th century's best-known Christian apologists. Lewis's radio broadcasts, his articles at books concerning uh, core Christian uh, doctrines continue to this day to influence and impact many folks, including myself. But there's more to Lewis than literature and theology. Lewis also published children's stories. And among his more popular children's stories was his Chronicles of Narnia series. Maybe some of you have read those. Lewis finished the first book in 1949. It was about 10 years after he originally conceived of the idea. And when we consider just the whole genre of fiction, a good story of fiction uh, it must include certain features, and it certainly must include an antagonist. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, has the white witch. And she fills the role of antagonist most successfully. You would know this if you read that story, or even watched the movie that was made uh, maybe 10 or 11, 12 years ago. Lewis paints this fictional land called Narnia, that was under the rule of the White Witch, he paints it as a very dark and dreary place. The White Witch had made winter continue for 100 years with no end in sight. And whenever someone got in, way, in her way, she would just simply turn that individual, that creature, into stone. Indeed, uh, Narnia, under the rule of the White Witch, was a dark and dreary place. Well, friends, we step out of the land of fiction to a land that we call today uh, the ancient Near East. Ancient because you and I are far removed from those days, far removed by time and by distance and by culture and by philosophy and by religion and by politics, by so much more. And when we consider the place that Jesus was born into, ancient Palestine, what we do find common to the people of that day is the symbols of light and darkness. This contrast between light and darkness was often used um, in a metaphorical sense. The light representing good and the darkness representing evil. It was not unusual to apply to a basic natural phenomenon such as light and the absence of light darkness metaphorically or symbolically, in a philosophical or even a spiritual manner. Even in our day, light and darkness is often used metaphorically to symbolize the moral contrast between good and evil. Well, today on the fourth Sunday in Advent, we are reminded of what the Apostle John said about Jesus Christ concerning his first coming, that first Advent. He said of Jesus this, in him, that is Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
John chapter 1, verse 4. The Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul, pardon me, the Apostle John, using a basic natural phenomenon such as light to describe the very person and nature of Jesus Christ. Well, as you consider these uh, comments, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. We'll read together the first 18 verses of the first chapter. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There is a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. I just repeated myself. Verse 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he he was before me. Verse 16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for this time as we uh, look at your word, as we look at uh, these initial 18 verses of John's gospel. Help us to understand, O oh Holy Spirit, these very important uh, words. Help us even this Christmas is it's just around the corner, literally 72 hours away or less. Uh, Lord, that God, you would, uh, you would help us understand the ramifications of that first advent. And not only that, but it is pointing to the second advent, the point pointing to the return of Jesus one day. We thank you, Lord, for all these blessings that you've given us over these years. And as we gather this Christmas to celebrate, may we indeed celebrate and praise and worship that first Advent, looking and ready, being ready for the second one that's coming one day. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we unpack a few of John's statements in these 18 verses that we just read, it would be to our prophet to take a moment and look at the bigger picture. And to do so properly requires us to understand some of the differences that we find here between John's Gospel and the other three Gospels in the New Testament, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, are often referred to as the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic simply, uh, simply meaning see together or to see together. And when we consider Jesus' ministry years, where he spent his time, the Synoptic Gospels focus primarily on Jesus' ministry in what was known at the time as Galilee. John's Gospel, however, focuses on what Jesus said and did in the city of Jerusalem and in that temple that was there as well. Each Gospel writer highlights as you look at those four Gospels, a different origin concerning Jesus. Matthew, for example, introduces the genealogy of Jesus from Abraham to David. You see this in the first 17 verses of Matthew's Gospel at the very beginning, chapter 1. And this reveals that Jesus is the promised Messiah of God of the Old Testament. Mark, he highlights that Jesus came from Nazareth, again in the very first chapter of his gospel. 
And this reveals that Jesus is a servant of God that the Old Testament prophets often spoke of. Luke, he provides the genealogy of Jesus from Adam in the third chapter of his gospel, verse 23 to 28. Thus revealing that Jesus is the perfect man, the second Adam. Additionally, when we think of John's gospel, he highlights that Jesus came from heaven thus revealing that Jesus is none other than God. All four gospel writers, as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, answers the question, who is Jesus? And John's gospel does likewise. He just does it in a different way sometimes. He answers the same question. For example, John highlights seven miracles of Jesus. Simply just seven miracles of Jesus. Six which are not found in the synoptics. John also gives us Jesus' very own words about himself. We call those the I am statements, the seven I am statements, which are not included at all in the synoptics. And John gives us the testimonies of those who testify about the identity of Jesus, such as John the Baptist that we just read a few comments about. John also tells us clearly, without any effort at all, it seems, why he wrote the gospel. John wrote his gospel, and he said it this way, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You find that in John chapter 20, verse 31. Well, friends, that should be enough of the bigger picture to help us to move forward and into a closer look at our text here. Someone once said that the John's Gospel is, quote, an example of both simplicity and great depth. And this is certainly evident as we look here at the first three verses, verses 1 to 3. These three verses jump out at us in a straightforward way. But my, oh my, the depth that John is reaching here is absolutely astounding. Unfortunately, time is not our friend today, so we want to go right to the question of the day. Who is Jesus? Well, according to John, Jesus is none other than the Son of God. This is what John meant when he said in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, a good and reliable Bible translation will have the word word capitalized. The ESV, which I'm using, does. I know the ESV does. I know the New King James Version does, etc., etc. Good, reliable translations translate the Greek word logos in this way. And this idea of the logos, as we think in the ancient days, had a long and rich history in Jewish and Greek thinking of their day. But John makes this term equal to the Messiah, equal to the Son of God, or any other phrase that we find in his gospel that portrays the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Well, all this is say this. Jesus Christ is the Logos, the Word. And Jesus Christ, John tells us, was in the beginning with God. Verse 2. This phrase in the beginning that we find here at verse 1 and 2 should sound somewhat familiar to us. For we have to go very ba back to the very beginning of beginnings. Genesis 1, chapter 1. In the beginning God created. My friends, this is as far as you and I can possibly go. As far as you and I can possibly grasp or even imagine in our minds. What was John saying about Jesus? Well, Jesus was with God before the first Adam existed, before anything existed. Or as an early church father, uh, Anathasis, said of Jesus in the 300s, quote, there never was when he was not. Let me say that again. There never was when he was not. Yes, of course, when Jesus walked the earth, he lived in time as a human being. But my friends, he was never bound by time. He had created time. And the Logos, the Word, was God. Verse 1. And the Logos, the Word, Logos, and did I say Logos? 
That's wrong. Logos, the word according to verse 3, created all things. All things, the text tells us, John tells us, were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 3. Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Colossae, is helpful for us. Paul said of Jesus, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. So there it is, folks. Here it is in all of its simplicity, and yet here it is in its great profundity. Verse 1 to 3 reveals that Jesus is God the Son. And along with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, God the Son is, uh, the, uh, God the Son is of the same substance, equal in power and glory. Jesus is the second person of the triune God who created all things, who sustains all things by his very word. And then as we move quickly here now to verse 4 and 5, the Apostle John does not skip a beat. From the certain reality of who Jesus is, the Son of God, it is reasonable and accurate and truthful that Jesus was life. Jesus was life. Verse 4. The question we need to ask then is, what then is this life that John points to? Well, my friends, again, we're constrained by the clock. So we will allow a few comments from some commentators. The first one said this, quote, the word is the source of all life, not only biological life, but the very principle of life. Another commentator put it this way, quote, that power which creates life and maintains all else in existence was in the Logos. And I'll paraphrase, was in Jesus. Well, we have the story of the day that Peter and John in those early days of the church were on their way to the temple to pray and along the way they came upon a lame beggar at the temple gates begging for money. And as Peter and John walked by, uh, Peter said to the beggar, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. We find this event in, chapters, in Acts chapter 3 verse 6. So the lame beggar, of course, was healed. And we find him, as the text explains, walking and leaping and praising God in the temple. And all people and, and so many people and all the people who were there were utterly astounded and they ran along with him in the temple. <coughs> Peter, seeing this, responded. He basically <coughs> gave them a sermon, if you will. And among the things he said to the people was this statement. You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. To this we are witnesses. Well, the point is made, is it not? In him, that is Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 4. They put Christ on the cross. They crucified him and he died. But God raised him from the dead. The darkness has not overcome it. Well, we want to move straight to verse 9. And there John said, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Verse 9. So along with verse 9, we have verse 4 and 5. John, they're using a natural phenomenon the symbols of light, of darkness, that point to a spiritual reality uh, and the nature of the Son of God, Jesus himself. We find other biblical authors doing the same thing. For example, <clears throat> the symbol of life is used to describe the glory of God's dwelling place. The Apostle Paul described the ascended Jesus as dwelling in inapproachable light in his first letter to Timothy in chapter 6, verse 16. We go to John's first letter, and he said this, that God is light, 1 John 1, 5. And light is used in the Old Testament to describe the illuminating power of the Word of God, 
where we read, your word is a lamp to my feet. We find that in Psalm 119, verse 105. Well, let's go back to Apostle John's Gospel. John used the natural phenomenon of light to describe Jesus as the illuminator, if you will, of mankind. We see this at verse 4 and 5 and 9. Jesus himself takes up the symbol of light when speaking of the reason he came on that first advent. And in describing himself, Jesus said, the light has come into the world. John 3, 19. Elsewhere, Jesus said of himself, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 8, verse 12. My friends, the life and light of Jesus are inexorably linked together. One time, um, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch. And as it was the habit of Paul, he would first go to the synagogue to teach and preach the gospel. And during one of those Sabbath moments, some Jewish religious leaders began to contradict Jesus, uh, Paul. They began to condemn him, to revile against him. And Paul responded to those Jews by saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 13, 46. And the very next thing Paul does is he quotes Isaiah 49, verse 6. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may have bring salvation to the ends of the earth. My friends, who was Isaiah prophesying about? Who was Isaiah prophesying about? Who was Paul speaking of to that Jewish rabble in the synagogue in <coughs> Colossae? In Antioch, pardon me. Who was it? Jesus, of course. Remember we said earlier that Mark's gospel revealed Jesus was from Nazareth and Jesus was a servant of God that the Old Testament prophets, like Isaiah, just here, as we heard, pointed to? Well, the point is made again, that Jesus is the true light which gives light to everyone. Verse 9. And this brings up a very important question for you and me. For all people. Jesus came to give light to everyone, as John put it, um, for, or as John put it at verse 16, from, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And then in the very next verse, John said, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So here's that question. Will you receive the light of Jesus this Christmas? Or have you received the light of Jesus? Have you received is grace and truth. And please hang on to that question and ponder it for a while. Think about it for a while. Let's consider the opposite to light, darkness. In the natural realm, darkness is defined as the partial or total absence of light. Biblically, we have seen light symbolizes God. Darkness biblically means anything that is anti-God. For example, those who are consciously and willingly and purposely walking in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, as Proverbs chapter 2, 13, 14. That is an example of darkness. Someone said of the spiritual darkness, quote, spiritual darkness is the state of a person who is living apart from God. The Apostle John put it in this way in his first letter. John said, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Remember, we just heard what Jesus said. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of light. Friends, if we walk in the ways of darkness, if we rejoice in doing evil, if we delight in the perverseness of evil, we do not have fellowship with God through his one and only Son, Jesus Christ. And the question I ask you to hold on to is back on the agenda. Have you received the light of Jesus? 
Setting aside all the preparations that you have made for Christmas. Setting aside all our cultural assumptions concerning the birth of Jesus Christ. Setting aside the buying and the spending and the giving and the receiving and the office parties and the family gatherings. Setting it all aside. When we look at the birth of Jesus Christ through the lens of the Word of God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who is and always has been, took on, the, on our form and came into a spiritually dead and dark and dreary world. Jesus, who created all things and sustains all things by his word, became flesh and dwelt among us, verse 14. And despite the darkness, despite the dark and dreary world that awaited him, that is here even this day, his light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Glory to God. If you, and only you and God know this, are living in rebellion toward God and his purposes and his will in Christ, you are living and walking in spiritual darkness. Even if you're smiling all the way. The word of God goes as far to say that the one who's living in spiritual darkness is separated from the life and light of God. Spiritual darkness blinds the one, blinds a person from the true light, which is Christ. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, has symbolism. The long season upon season of winter represents that Narnia <clears throat> was in the control of an evil force under the influence of the White Witch. Winter, in a way, then symbolized death. And the reader soon finds that after the white witch, white witch pardon me, was defeated by Aslan the lion, the snow begins to melt, and the land once under the spell of the white witch comes to life with the colors and sounds and smells of spring. Spring symbolizing that life had returned and that goodness had returned to Narnia as well. Well, the question remains before us this Christmas. Well, we receive the light of Jesus. Have we received the light of Jesus? Or will we continue to walk in the darkness of our world and our hearts? The Apostle John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, who was a witness of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, said this, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from sin. 1 John, chapter 1, verse 7. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for that first advent. And I thank you that it points to the second advent to come, the return of Christ, as promised. In the meantime and in between time, we live in a spiritually dark world. And even those that might be hearing this or watching this are in a spiritual walk, dark walk themselves. Lord, thank you for that first advent, that the light of the world came into the world, went to the cross, and died for the sins of the world, for my sin, for all sin. Thank you, Lord, for that grace and truth. Thank you, Lord, for that marvelous love that you have. And we just praise you for all that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, there it is. The fourth Sunday of Advent is in the books. And uh, I just wanted to take this time on behalf of my wife, uh, Pat, to wish each and every one of you a very blessed and Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. Shalom.